Last week, we started going over the Gospel of Philip in our Missing Books of the Bible series that we do on Tuesday evenings on the Dark Outpost TV. And if you can remember, I labeled last week's video as part one because this week we want to go deeper into Philip's life after the death and resurrection of Jesus. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. Again, a special thank you to all of our patrons. Without you, you we would not have been able to order a new light system because last week our light, our amplifier blew. And so thank you so much because your support meant that I could continue filming this week and get us hopefully back to our regularly scheduled programming. As always, I want to give a very special thank you to Tiffany Monroe, who is our producer here at Esoteric Atlanta. Again, Tiffany is a Reiki master here in Atlanta, Georgia. They do, her and her husband do run a nonprofit that's based around spiritual healing with an emphasis on Reiki. If you would like to get in touch with Tiffany regarding her services, there is an email address for her down in the description box below. And another shout out to Adam for sending me an awesome recording from his time in Hawaii where he got to talk with a tour guide about some cool creatures that are from the Hawaiian Islands. Again, I did not have my lighting in and so Adam sent me an old recording for me to play for you guys so you would have something to listen to on Monday. Um, Adam is an author of a book about multiverses. We have a snippet of the book always down in the description box below and I'm hoping to get Adam back on the channel in the future to talk more about his work for you guys. All right, let's get started. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we're going to be talking about the Acts of Philip. Before we get into the acts of Philip, I have had a lot of people request that we go even deeper on Wednesdays on these discussions as we recap what we talked about on the Dark Outpost TV the night before. Um, the reason why I can't go too deep into these banned books is because of censorship. I think you guys are fully, fully aware that the big companies out there today are censoring people like crazy. They have been censoring people since March, really, when um, people started to have different ideas and opinions on what's going on in the world. And as terrifying as that is, I do believe that things are about to change for the better. However, when YouTube had a big purge a few months back, David's channel, as you know, was one of the channels that lost its platform for simply having a different opinion than the mainstream narrative. I myself have been struck by YouTube um, for some of my past videos of investigation that I did. And because the banned books of the Bible were banned for a reason, were censored for a reason, again, I have to be very careful about what I say when I recap it for you guys. In fact, a lot of religions are being struck anyway. It's, it's not even that um, when I do my research, I'm not even trying to take a biased stand, even though I am biased towards spirituality and faith. I'm just trying to give you guys the information, but they are trying to take away people's voice. Now, for me, if this channel is ever taken down off of this platform, I will continue to post on BitChute. I have not put anything on BitChute yet. I have cataloged all of my work though, so if it were to happen, you would be able to find all my videos over on BitChute or Rumble. Um, I also have the Patreon page as well where I can post videos too, but right now I am trying to keep it on YouTube for the time being. Now, the beautiful thing about David's platform, which there is a link in the description box below, is that since he was taken off of YouTube, he was able to open up his own platform. And so that means that when I go on his platform to talk about these banned books of the Bible or any of his other guests, 
guests that come on that have a lot of explosive information to share, we can talk freely. We don't have to worry about being censored or being taken down. Now, there is, I think it's like a $2 a month or something to, to be a part of that platform. It's a very, very, very low, low rate. And that basically just goes to pay for the platform so that we can continue to share information and discuss freely with these censored ideas and information. Now, again, if you live in a country where you can't access that website, I've gotten that message before, please email David at americatalks at hotmail.com and discuss that with him and see if there's something you guys can do to get the information to your country as well. But again, I do think that the tides of change are coming and we will get our freedom of speech reinstalled. It's our first amendment right here in this country, in the United States of America, that's being trampled on right now. And it's also a right of humanity. To take away someone's freedom of speech is a crime against humanity. I myself have gotten two threats this week because I have a very different opinion on what's going on in the world that goes against the mainstream media narrative. I do believe we are going into the age of Aquarius, into the a thousand years of peace, and I do believe that the person that the media has labeled the bad guy is actually the good guy and the one that's trying to free not just this country, but all countries. When a country is able to maintain its sovereignty, that means the people are also able to remain sovereign. And that is how God created us. He created us to be free and sovereign. But with that being said, I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep delivering videos here. I'm going to keep going on David's channel and talk about these subjects that they don't want us talking about. I'm going to keep trying to wake people up to what's really happening because freedom is important. And if anything, at 37 years old, this whole issue has taught me that there are things worth fighting for and it is worth risking your life to make sure humanity remains free. And something religion and spirituality teaches us, and really the gospels, the banned gospels of the Bible really teach us, is that death is nothing to be afraid of because we are eternal beings. And I'm not saying that to scare you guys. I'm just, I don't think anything's gonna happen to us. I think it's all gonna be okay. I just wanna let you guys know that I will not back down. This country, the world, humanity is worth fighting for. So with all that being said, let's get into the Acts of Philip. So if you remember from last week when we talked about the Gospel of Philip, we also talked about there being a bit of a confusion on what Philip they were referring to. There was the Apostle Philip, who was one of the 12 Apostles of Jesus, and there was also the Evangelist Philip. Now a lot of people in the past and currently think these two guys are the same person. But as we said last week, in the book of Luke, it may, it's very clear that they are two separate people. With the Acts of Philip, there's also kind of the same issue, where people think that maybe the Acts of Philip is about Philip the Evangelist and not the Apostle. I believe that this is about Philip the Apostle. In my notes, I labeled the Acts of Philip as being heresy or a biography of the real Philip. Now, the church, of course, labeled this as heresy. I think this is an actual biography. So let's talk about the Acts of Philip. With the Acts of Philip, you're going to have to read it for yourself. I can't go through all of it because it is a very long work. Um, but I, every week I think I found my favorite missing gospel, but I really did enjoy the Acts of Philip. Now with this particular book, for a long time, we had a few pieces of the Acts of Philip. It, it wasn't found in the Nag Hammadi Library or anything like that. They already had some of the Acts available. But in 1974, they found an almost complete copy of the Acts of Philip in a monastery in Greece. Now this is kind of important because Remember from last week, Philip was the, the apostle that could speak Greek, and Philip was a Greek name. And many people believe that there is a possibility that Philip was part Greek, and, and maybe that is why he attracted a lot of the Greek people to Jesus. Now what's also interesting about the Acts of Philip is the way that it's written. It's written in the style of potentially Greek mythology, the way that all the stories of the people, the, the deities of, of Greece were written in the past. Now, a lot of the church people will say, well, this is why it's heresy as well, which to that I say, WTF man, no, it's not. 
when we come from a culture, we are ingrained in the way that culture is set up. So for the, the students of Philip that were of Greek descent, were used to hearing stories told in a mythical way. And so when they went back to recount Philip's life, they probably told it in the way they knew how to tell it, which was influenced by the mythology they had studied as a child. Now I say the way Philip's students wrote about his life because the Acts of Philip was probably written around 200 AD, over a hundred years after Philip's death. So these are stories that have been told from student to student to student until somebody eventually wrote them down. Now the Acts of Philip can be seen in four different cycles or phases. The last one being Philip's martyrdom in the town of Hierapolis or Hierapolis, however you say it. it. The town doesn't exist anymore. It's an archeological dig. Um, and a lot of the, the things that they've discovered in this particular site, it's in Turkey today, modern day Turkey, prove the acts of Philip to be accurate. In fact, in 2011, they found Philip's tomb. There are also places in the Acts of Philip, especially towards the end when it gets towards his martyrdom, um, where they talk about the city swallowing the temple of the viper whole. Well, we know, we can look at Roman records and know that there were earthquakes around this time. So again, I say, is this all made up heresy or is this a biography of someone that lived? In the Acts of Philip, you also have the leading lady of Miriam. Well, who is Miriam? I believe that Miriam was Philip's wife. Now, in the Bible, she is referred to as Mary of Bethany. And in fact, when we talked about Mary Magdalene, we talked about a verse in the Bible where Mary Magdalene was walking with Mary of Bethany. Miriam is a version of Mary. Now, a lot of people get very confused by this because they refer to Mary in the Acts of Philip as Sister Mary. So they think that this is a gross ancestral relationship between Philip and his sister. But the way I see it is that they're referring to Mary, Miriam, as Sister Miriam because she was their sister in Christ and they were out apostling to all the pagans. In fact, Miriam in the Acts of Philip is also considered an apostle. We saw this with Mary Magdalene too. The church did a really good job of getting rid of all the females that were students of Jesus. In fact, the Jesus movement was really very groundbreaking when it came to women. Jesus gave women the right to teach just as he gave the men. And we see this in these Gnostic gospels because as we know in yoga too, our natural bodies, our genders, our race, all that stuff, that is just an illusion of who we are in the natural world. Our eternity is our soul, our spirit anyway, and that doesn't even have a gender. What's interesting about Miriam as well is that before Jesus' death, it seems that she was almost like Jesus' secretary. In fact, when James the Just was dividing up all the disciples and they were these fugitives on the run and they were figuring out where each of them should go in the world to get out of the motherland and um, preach the word and also try to save themselves, Miriam was the one that kept record of where everybody went. Now I say James the Just, and if you are following along on the Dark Outpost, we've talked about this a little bit. It will probably become even more of a subject as we get even further into these banned books. There is a lot of dispute between James the Just and Peter. Um, the banned books, there's a theory that Peter was not the person that Jesus wanted his church built on. That might be a manipulation. Now I've been to St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. I've been to the Vatican. We know Vatican means the head of the serpent. We know that the Pope is dirty. I mean, now we definitely know that the Pope is dirty. If you've been keeping up with current events in um, our world and what's going on in this battle between dark and light, we know that the Pope is, he's pretty dark. He's a pretty dark cat. And we also know that through a lot of whistleblowers that there are satanic practices that happen at the Vatican, especially in the rooms underneath the Vatican. So when we look at these missing gospels, we see Jesus being very insistent that the disciples look towards James the Just for direction. Now, who was James the Just again? He was Jesus's biological brother, and he ran the 
temple, the church in Jerusalem after Jesus' resurrection, and James the Just was martyred as well eventually, as were most of the apostles, including Philip, which we're going to get to. Now in the Acts of Philip, we also see Bartholomew, which we see Philip and Bartholomew together a lot in the canonized gospel as well, or Nathaniel, he has two, two names, but we see them partnering. Him, um, Philip and Miriam are kind of like the trio that partners towards the end of the Acts of Philip in Hierapolis. In fact, while Philip and Miriam are kind of making their way to Hierapolis in the Acts, Bartholomew is in Armenia preaching, and again, they meet up and then head into this town in Turkey towards the end of the story. So again, a little bit about Hierapolis before we get into summarizing what happens in Hierapolis. It is again a town in Turkey and it, it translates as the holy city. There were are, are fault lines under the city. As I said before, some of the miraculous events that are talked about in the Acts of Philip, again, like the earth swallowing up some of these like pagan temples, we can look back and know that there were earthquakes that happened during this time as well that could have very easily looked as if the ground was swallowing up parts of this city. Hierapolis was originally founded by the Greeks, again, going back to Philip, potentially being part Greek and being able to speak Greek. But the Roman Empire had taken over in 133 BC, so there was a lot of Roman, in, Roman tyranny that was happening there, just like back in Israel, where they had been basically going through what we're going through right now, but like 2,000 years ago. But nonetheless, Hierapolis was a great place for Philip and Miriam and Bartholomew to eventually set up shop because it was considered a spa town. There's a lot of really interesting things about this area of the world. And I will place a documentary in the description box that goes deeper into Hierapolis and what they've found there in the dig so far. The people at that time considered Hierapolis to be like a portal. And so kind of like the Dead Sea, like when we talked about the Dead Sea Scrolls, Herod the Great would go there to heal. People would go to Hierapolis to heal themselves. In fact, when we see in the Acts of Philip, when um, Philip, Miriam, and uh, Bartholomew will walk into the North Gate, into Hierapolis, they see people lining the streets that are sick and they're trying to heal themselves. And so Philip and Miriam and Bartholomew basically set up a, a healing shop and they start to create these miracles that are given to them through the power of God to heal people. And this is how they start to convert people from this Roman pagan faith into this newfound Christian faith. But again, as I said, before they get to Hierapolis, there's a whole chain of events that happen, and we're just gonna go over the synopsis of the Acts of Philip, starting with right after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Philip, we open with Philip being pretty emotional. He's with all the disciples. They're at this meeting, right, where with James the Just, and they're trying to figure out where everybody's gonna go. Again, this isn't just a demand that they need to go and like teach the gospel. Again, they were fugitives at this point. All of them had a, basically a death warrant on them because they had supported Jesus. So they're at this meeting. They're tr they gotta go. They gotta run. They gotta get the heck out of Dodge. And they're also trying to do this in a more organized way because on top of having to leave Israel, they're gonna have to. They're gonna also go and spread the message of their their savior, Jesus. So Philip is, is super emotional, which I would be too. I mean, you talk about trauma and PTSD. You've just watched your savior and your teacher be crucified and killed in one of the most excruciating ways. You know they want to do the same thing to you. And now you've got to carry the responsibility of getting yourself and your family out of town and also teaching, knowing that you are putting your life at risk. I would probably be very emotional as well. So I don't blame Philip one bit. I'm sure a lot of them were very emotional. But the interesting thing is, and I think this is quite a beautiful thing, and I see this with people and relationships a lot, when you have a, a true partnership with someone. We see Miriam, his wife, wife, who's also the secretary writing down where everybody's going to go, really help Philip get his strength together to go out and do what he's got to do. In a lot of the places in um, the Acts of Philip, we see Miriam described as the man and Philip described as the woman. And this is not some weird, like transgendered 
issue. This is like Jewish mysticism. They're talking out about particular personality traits that these people carried. And it seemed that Miriam was more of the stoic person. She had a lot of strength and wisdom, whereas Philip was probably a little bit more emotional. It didn't mean that they were like calling each other the different gender or sex or that they were trying to degrade each other. It was just describing their personality traits as people. There are a lot of very feminine feminine women out there that are very strong and stoic but are still women. And there are a lot of very masculine men out there that can be very emotional and very compassionate. It doesn't really mean a whole lot. So it kind of drives me crazy when I see other people commentating on this and they're making a big deal about the fact that they refer to Miriam as the man and Philip as the woman when it, it's totally taken out of context because this was just the way this Jewish mysticism described a, pers a particular set of personality traits. So after Philip bucks up and he and Miriam go off on their journey, they first stop in Athens and they're in Athens, Greece for a couple of years. Now it is believed by this point, Paul had already been through Athens. So it was kind of like they were already, it was easy because there were people had already heard this message before. And the thing about Athens as well is that at, the, at this point, Athens was, as you rem remember, we talked about Alexandria. Athens was also a place where it was a lot of scholars, a lot of philosophers. And so free speech was more accepted in Athens than probably anywhere else because of its level of scholarly attention from the locals. They were not intimidated by hearing Philip preach. In fact, interestingly enough, the only group of people Philip seemed to have a bit of an issue with while in Athens was the Jewish community. The Jewish community was very skeptical of him and were constantly trying to get back to Israel to figure out who this new sect of Jewish Nazarenes were. What were these people about? When in reality, as we saw in the Gospel of Philip, where he talks about when it was just the Hebrew faith, it was like they were a mother without a father. It was like the family wasn't complete. And then after Jesus came, they became complete because the prophecy had been fulfilled. So I find that very fascinating that it was the Jewish community that was the most skeptical of Philip. After Athens, we see Philip go into a town called Nicotera, which I don't know even ex if it even exists anymore. Um, some people think it might be Athens too. That might be just another name for Athens. I don't know. I'm not really well versed in Greek history. So if anybody knows, you can leave that in the comments below. Apparently Nicotera though is where we get the word Nike because it was named after the God of Nike, which was the God of victory. And so again, we're seeing Philip going into these more pagan places and you can refer back to episodes we did on the Dark Outpost regarding the Canaanites and how the Canaanites did infiltrate the Church of Rome as well as some of the Greek mythology. That's why you see a lot of similarities between Moloch and a lot of the other Greek and Roman deities. Now I do apologize for all the sirens going off around me. It's been crazy. Um, you might hear helicopters, you might hear all sorts of stuff again. Welcome to 2021 and I do live right in the middle of Atlanta, Georgia and we know that there's a lot of military action going on right now. So I do apologize for those sounds are annoying. There's not anything I can do about it right now. So I hope that that doesn't bother you too much. So after Nicotera, um, Philip and his wife Miriam are in the late 50s AD, they head into Asia Minor. This is where they then meet up with their pal Bartholomew, and this is when they move into Hierapolis, which again, I said earlier, they walk through the North Gate, they see all these people who are sick, and they decide to set up like a clinic, a shop to help people heal them through their acts of miracles through their god that's very different from the god of, of the Greeks and the Romans. Now, a lot of people have viewed the Acts of Philip as complete heresy and a little crazy because we see Philip talking to animals. We also see the referencing of dragons. Now, if you've been listening along on the Dark Outpost to some of David uh, Zublik's other guests, like Jesse, I'm not so sure this is heresy. We know that the Nephilim or the giants are real and I'm starting to have a different perspective on this idea of dragons. Uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit with the vampire episode as well, the order of the dragon. You do also see in the Acts of Philip the temple of the viper, which is the snake, the serpent. Um, again, the Vatican, it means the head of the serpent and we know what the snake represents in this big galactic spiritual battle and they also talk 
about drinking blood. And we all know what that means. It starts with an A. I can't say it. I'll get censored, but I think you guys all know what I'm talking about because this is not so far-fetched. We, we know. Welcome to the Great Awakening. We know that's not far-fetched now. So here we have this town where people are talking about dragons and they're drinking blood and they're worshiping the snake and you got like Philip and Miriam and Bartholomew in there talking about a completely different way of living. They start performing all these miracles and all of a sudden they start baptizing people. Philip is baptizing the men, Miriam is baptizing the women. They start to, to gather quite a crowd. And it almost seems like when I was reading it, like Miriam's kind of like Philip's opening act, right? She's She seems like she's quite a little socialite. Like if she was living in today's day and age, she would be the wife that was always throwing the cocktail parties. That's kind of how I saw her. And she would go on and like warm the crowd up before Philip or ba Bartholomew came on and gave the big sermon. Now the proverbial shit really hits the fan when we're introduced to Nicanora. Nicanora was a woman living in Hierapolis that was married to a very powerful Roman leader in the town. Now Nicanora was born Hebrew. She was born a Jew and she grew up Hebrew. But when she married her husband, she left all that behind her. She started practicing the religion of the Romans or the Canaanites and she stopped practicing her Hebrew faith. It even talks about in the Acts of Philip that Nicanora didn't even speak Hebrew anymore. And, and, and by the time we meet her, she's very sick. She's in bed, just very, very, very sick. And she hears of these three Hebrew people, people like her, that are here in Hierapolis and they're healing people through their faith, which was a variation of the faith that she was born into. And so she's kind of called to go and try to speak to these people to, to try to heal herself. And when we see Miriam meet Nicanora, Miriam immediately recognizes that Nicanora is also Hebrew and starts start speaking Hebrew to her. And all of a sudden it's like, it's like riding a bike. It's like once you learn how to ride a bike, even if you don't ride for years, you, you figure it out pretty quickly. She's same thing with the language. Nicanora all of a sudden starts speaking Hebrew again after years of not speaking it. It's almost like she's found her home again. And so she has this meeting with Miriam and uh, Philip and Bartholomew and she ends up turning her back on her adopted Roman faith and becoming baptized again into this new version of Judaism, which is the Christian faith. Because again, remember, the Messiah, Jesus, was prophesied in the Hebrew Bible. And so the Christian faith is technically the completion of the Jewish faith. Well, Nicanora is so now just, she's fallen in love with this new faith. She's praying again to the Hebrew God, the God of Israel, the Almighty God, um, the Abrahamic God. And then her tyrant husband, this Roman dude, comes like looking for her again. He's all pissed because his wife is, I guess from his opinion, his point of view, his wife is like joining this cult. I'm sure that's what it seems to him because he's Roman, right? He's a Gentile and he's, he's seeing his wife kind of like go to these people and now she's refusing to come home until he converts to this, this Christian faith as well. Now I'm gonna read you a verse from the Acts of Philip that I thought was really fascinating, um, especially if you've been studying, you know, the Draco and the reptilians and, um, you know, the, the cabal, the Illuminati, the deep state, and all their goings on. And we know that they were the Canaanites. And it's a really fascinating passage where it's like they're telling Nicanora that she had been given um, as a pledge or a sacrifice over to these Romans to be used by the dragon, but that Jesus is like freeing her, is cutting her bonds of servitude to this Canaanite religion. I mean, you take what you want, what you will with it. And maybe if I'd read this passage like 10 years ago, I wouldn't have gotten it. But now it, it makes it, it makes sense in this great awakening. Let's just say that. So I'm going to go ahead and read that. You let me know your thoughts on it. 
It says, daughter of the father, you are my mistress. You have been given as a pledge to the serpent, but Jesus, our redeemer, has come to deliver you through us, to break your bands, to cut them, and to remove them from you from their root, because you are my sister. One mother brought us forth as twins. Now, again, we see this idea of twins, which we talked about with the book of Thomas, or Didymus, that we are the twin of Jesus, that we are all children in spirit to the almighty God. And so it, it sounds like Miriam is telling Nicanora that the bonds of servitude are cut through Jesus. And regardless of what agreement was made with your father or whatever with you to become a servant to this cult of serpent worshiping pagans, you're now free because you are my twin. We are children of a living God. Now I'm gonna give a little bit of a trigger warning here because I'm gonna to try to be careful because I don't want YouTube to censor this because I think this is such a cool book we all need to know about and I really encourage you to go read it for yourself. But the Acts of Philip does get into um, their execution. Uh, what happens to, to Philip and Miriam and Bartholomew at the end of the book. Um, now, basically their execution, they had been kind of watched by the Roman authorities for a while. They, they were very, um, they were kind of troublemakers as far as like they were very much going against the mainstream narrative. Interesting, right? Like the same thing's happening now. Um, they were trying to spread the truth and they were trying to help people. And, um, when it came to Nick Nora, that was, again, that's when the shit hit the fan because that's, that was the straw that broke the camel's back. This Roman ruler that was her husband, was pissed and so they sealed their fate and they had death warrants put out for them now um it gets very explicit into what happened to mariam she was um ba basically r-a-p-e-d many times by many people and this is like a 70 year old woman at this time they're all in there they're all elderly and so as horrific as that action is for anyone to experience to imagine like a grandmother having to experience that is is pretty pretty gnarly but throughout the whole experience she's still telling philip to continue to to preach um bartholomew was nailed to the temple um and philip was hung upside down basically on a cross in front of the the temple there is a pretty sweet passage where as they're going through the torment um philip looks at bartholomew and smiles now a lot of people in commentaries i listened to were like yeah they thought that they were being martyred and they were going to be like have their crowns in heaven because they were martyred that, that's not what i got from it at all um it was almost like w throughout the pain and the excruciating pain of death they um they knew they were going home um, it was like as soon as this this was over as soon as the natural body was dead uh, they, their soul would be going home and you have to remember these people knew Jesus and they saw his resurrection It wasn't like they were walking in on blind faith They had literally seen and witnessed everything with their own two eyes So it was it was a homecoming for them now an interesting twist has happened though because they hang like that they said that for days and we see Philip get really frustrated. He gets very, very frustrated that they haven't died yet. And so he starts to curse all the people in the town in Hierapolis and the town that's when we have the earthquake and it kind of swallows them up. And like Jesus comes down and he's like, yo, bro, like you, you can't, you can't ch exchange one evil for another evil. That's wrong. You can't do that. And so basically like Jesus pulls the people back out and it ends up becoming a miracle because then these people have now seen the light and they've seen God and they're now like Christian, but still, um, Philip is told by God, by Jesus that after he passes, he's going to have to basically spend like 40 days, uh, walking the earth as a spirit before he's going to be allowed into the kingdom of heaven, just to kind of repent for doing such a wicked thing to the people and his frustration in Hierapolis. What's interesting as well is because when we look at the picture of Jesus on the cross, when Jesus was being crucified and going through that excruciating pain, we don't really see him super frustrated. We see him say, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. There's always this level of, of calm with Jesus. But with Philip, we do see him get a little bit frustrated. And I'm sure, I mean, I probably would have done the same thing because I cannot imagine how painful that death must have been. Now, what I got from the acts of Philip in the end as well is that Bartholomew and Miriam both survived this execution attempt and it was Philip who passed away. And I'm gonna read you the last 
part of the Acts of Philip and just see what you think about it after Philip has wandered the earth for his 40 days and goes into heaven. So basically it says, after the 40 days, the Savior, having appeared in the form of Philip, said to Bartholomew and Miriam, my beloved brethren, do you wish to rest in the rest of God? Paradise has been opened to me and I have entered into the glory of Jesus. Go away to the place appointed for you, for the plant that has been set apart and planted in this city shall bear excellent fruit. Having therefore saluted the brethren and prayed for each of them, they departed from the city of Hierapolis of Asia, and Bartholomew departed, and Miriam proceeded to Jordan. And what remain entered the church of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom all glory and strength forever and ever. Amen. And that's the Acts of Philip. Now again, last night we went into way more detail. We went through more Bible verses. We looked at more angles of this story. Like I said, this video might get censored. I don't I don't know because I have said a few things that aren't allowed in um in a communist America now. Um, but if you would like to go further, please join us on the Dark Outpost. So I really hope you guys will join us over on David's channel on Tuesday evenings. He's got really awesome guests that come on. Um, I'm there on Tuesdays. I think Jesse's there on Thursdays and he's got other guests that come on that are whistleblowers or have inside information. And, um, this is we're right at the pinnacle of what we've been fighting for for a very long time and that is for us to come in again into a place where we're all sovereign and free and the evils of our war world are eradicated from the world just like there it's promised in the war war scroll that we went over a few weeks ago here on this channel and on david's channel with all that being said, I really hope this video is not censored or taken down. Again, if my channel were to ever be taken down, if you can't find it one day, I will be loading up on BitChute and probably Rumble as well if that were to happen. Until that day happens, I'll continue to load up on YouTube, but know that I have back backlogged all of my videos, even the ones that you can't find right now that I had to private because of YouTube. If those are videos that you are looking for and you can't find them, just email me and I'll send them, I'll send you a copy. Um, I've also given a lot of those over to David as well. Some of the videos that I had to take off of my channel because of YouTube and they're also on the Dark Outpost as well where you can find them there on his private platform. I can't express to each of you enough how much I appreciate you and I will suggest as we've heard make sure you got food in your house especially if you live in the United States and you live near a major city make sure you got some food um, make sure you've got a car that's full of gas for everybody listening please go and get some cash out of the ATM machine we have heard um, from some sources that there's a possibility that they're going to shut off credit cards and debit cards I don't know if that will happen or not we pray it doesn't happen. We pray that, that they're able to kind of stop everything before it gets to that, that place. But just make sure you're prepared just in case. And if you are awake and you do know what's really happening, not what the mainstream media tells us is happening, now is also our time to be of service. I know that's frustrating because so many people out there have been horribly nasty to those. The people that have been brainwashed and MK ultra mind controlled by the media have been very, um, horribly horribly mean to us but if it comes down to the point where where we need to have extra food I, if you are awake and you have the resources to do it i would get even more food just so that you can be of service to those people and have food for them if they need it or you can loan them twenty dollars if they need it and just be really be the bigger person because for us as the children of light, those that know the truth and know what's really happening in the galactic world, not just in our world, but in the celestial world as well, this is a huge, huge battle of good versus evil. This is not just about the United States. This is a really big thing. And those that are of the light, we're of service to others. And so we need to swallow our pride and be able to help those that are gonna be so lost once all the declassification happens and once everything is out and open and clear. But other than that, I hope you guys are doing really, really well and keeping your mind calm and practicing your breathing and your exercising and your eating well. And you're trying to just kind of not get to that place of total panic. Remember, fear and panic is very low vibrational and it's what the darkness wants us to be afraid and wants us to panic because they feed off of that. But know that the God, our God, Almighty God, the light, 
is way stronger than the darkness because once you turn the light on, the darkness has nowhere to hide. Um, so just be at peace and know that everything is under control and we're going to be okay. I'm so happy that you joined me again for this story. I, again, I hope you guys are all well and being safe. Thank you to Josh McKay for doing our music. If you would like to buy our opening song, there is a link down below. Thank you to Todd Roderick for, as always, helping me get this video up on to the interwebs for you to watch and be good to each other be kind to each other and hopefully i will see you on friday unless they like shut our internet off or something which is a possibility but if not there will be a video for you on friday i will talk to you guys soon bye